Good afternoon. I'm Lynette Clementson. I'm director of Wallace House here at the University of Michigan. Wallace House runs three programs. The Knight Wallace Fellowships for Journalists, which is a program that's residential to the university here. We bring a cohort of accomplished journalists from around the world every year to the university for an immersive year of study. We also have a program called Wallace House Presents, which what is what brings you here today, our public events program on campus and around the country to get people engaged through journalism with public engagement, public policy, um, politics, and civic engagement. And we have the Livingston Awards for Young Journalists. In the journalism world, people often refer to the Livingston Awards as the Pulitzers for the Young. We give three prizes each year, one for excellence in local reporting, one for national reporting, and one for international reporting to exceptional journalists under 35 years old. And often it's shocking how young uh, the, the journalists are and how truly excellent their work is. It is the Livingston Awards that brings us here today to talk about uh, the story that won last year for international reporting with the excellent reporter who wrote it. I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for this event, the Ford School of Public Policy, and within the Ford School, the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program. So we're here to talk about technology, politics, public policy, uh, and certainly that is an issue of domestic concern, but today we're going to look at the topic through the Philippines. By now, we all realize that social media platforms can be manipulated to steer opinion, but just how easy is it to do, and how is it done? In June of 2019, reporter Davy Alba, who was then with BuzzFeed, won the Livingston Award for International Reporting for her investigation into Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte's shrewd manipulation of Facebook to amass political and social control. He used it to punish enemies and opponents, and ultimately to corrupt government. It actually wasn't that Duterte was savvy with social media or anything digital. Of course, he had people who worked for him who were. But he was able to do this because his particular political push happened to align conveniently with Facebook's corporate campaign to dominate the information landscape in the Philippines. I hope that you all received a copy of Davy's story when you came in. Did you all receive a copy of the story? If not, we will make sure you get it when you leave because I really would like everyone to be able to read the story. We're going to talk about the details of it today um, so that you can dive in. And we do have people following us on our live stream We'd like to invite all of you to join the conversation when we move from our panel to question and answer. If you're joining us on live stream, you can tweet your questions to us using the hashtag Wallace House and hashtag Policy Talks. That will make, make sure that we see your questions. Um, and for those of you in the room, We'd like you to write your questions on question cards. Some of you got them as you were entering the room. Some of you may have a question come to you as the panelists are talking. If you would like a question card, simply raise your hand and someone will come around, hand it to you, and they'll be walking around to pick up your cards. We have two Knight Wallace fellows here who are following the conversation both on Twitter and in the room, and we'll make sure everyone's questions um, are included in the conversation. Before I introduce the panelists, I want to read to you just a, a bit from Davy's story. Um, the Livingston Awards is for excellence in reporting, but it also is for wonderful storytelling, um, which Davy did. So wonderful, in fact, that when she wrote this, she was with BuzzFeed, and shortly after the awards, she moved to the New York Times. 
where she is now on the uh, technology desk covering disinformation. In August of 2016, a handful of crude images began circulating widely throughout Facebook's Filipino community. A middle-aged man and a woman having clumsy sex atop a tacky floral bedspread. The man's face, obscured by shadows, was impossible to make out. The woman's was not. She appeared to be Senator Ly Lila de Lima, a fierce critic of Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte and his bloody war on drugs. But the woman was not de Lima. The senator issued a strong public denial. That's not me, I don't understand. And internet sleuths subsequently tracked the provenance of the images to a porn site. I'm gonna jump further a bit. De Lima was soon beset by disparaging fake news reports that quickly spread across Facebook. She had pole danced for a convict. She used government funds to buy a $6 million mansion in New York. The Queen of England had congratulated the Philippine Senate for ousting her. Six months later, her reputation fouled. De Lima was arrested and detained on drug charges, though she vehemently disputes them. For all the recent hand-wringing in the United States over Facebook's monopolistic power, the mega platform's grip on the Philippines is something else entirely. Thanks to a social media hungry populace and heavy subsidies that keep Facebook free to use on mobile phones, Facebook has completely saturated the country. And because using other data, like accessing a news site via mobile web browser is precious and expensive, for most Filipinos, the only way online is through Facebook. So that gives you uh, a starting point for why this was a story that captured the attention of our judges and why it spoke not just to the Philippines but to an issue of our time. The circumstances of political, disin uh, political disinformation campaigns vary from country to country, certainly they do, but there are clearly things we can all take from focused stories like this one that Davey wrote to help us be better informed not just as news consumers, but as voters in our own countries. I'm going to now turn the program over to our moderator, Molly Kleinman, who's program manager of our partner for this event, the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program here at the Ford School. Molly will guide our discussion with Davey and with our other panelists, Jadan Budak, Assistant Professor in the School of Information and the College of Engineering. So I'd like to turn it over now to Molly and we will open it up to questions after we hear a little bit more about the topic from our panelists. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Lynette. Um, so I'm just gonna dive right in, I think, Davey. Um, so to start, we heard a, a small piece of the article, but if you could tell us a little bit more about the circumstances of the article and what interested you in the story. Sure, um, so th first of all, thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here and it's kind of just, I'm in, still in disbelief about sort of the opportunities I've gotten from winning this award. Um, so uh, this article, the genesis of the idea really started um, started from the fact that I actually grew up in the Philippines. I moved to the U.S. when I was 22 years old and I had been noticing for a while from friends and family how obsessed they were um, about Facebook and they were on Facebook all the time and then it started to shift when you presidential elections of the Philippines um, were getting underway when the campaigns were starting. Uh, you know, from just like cute cat videos to um, like this really, really extreme rhetoric um, backing certain candidates that had really aggressive platforms like Duterte who had a uh, an aggressive law and order platform that um, he used to promote what he said was the way to solve the country's problems, which was a war on drugs. Uh, so when the, in the months leading up to the presidential election, um, I just would go on my Facebook feed and would see just 
friends and family posting about Duterte, um, a lot of them pro Duterte, uh, and it just was baffling how much engagement was going on uh, around him. And then there were these influencers that ended up sort of popping up around him, uh, seemingly riding this wave of um, popularity that he was experiencing on Facebook. And it would be it would be so strange. Like a, an influencer would post something, and within ten minutes, there would be maybe like two thousand five hundred likes on it, and like hundreds of shares. And it really confused me. I was sort of like, is this? is this automated? You know, like, what is going on here? Um, so I pitched uh, this topic um, to my publication at the time. I was working for Wired. Um, and it just took a long time to report out. So I actually switched jobs um, and brought the story to BuzzFeed. Uh, but, you know, it's a really complicated sort of multi-layered thing where the support is real and the engagement is real. And there's also a mix of troll farms and clickbait farms um, in the Philippines who are ginning up this engagement. And so um, that part, you know, that had been reported on a little bit, but I wanted to get at the figures, public figures who enabled Duterte to run this extremely successful presidential campaign and absolutely capture and, uh, you know, sort of capture public opinion and have all of the conversations essentially on Facebook be very pro his administration. So, you know, that was leading up to the election. But even now, as you know, he continues uh, his presidency, the drug war, which is a awful <laughs> um, human rights violation has been going on now for three and a half years. And he still uses Facebook and these influencers and this engagement to provide cover for this drug war. Um, did, was that an answer to your question? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So what is it about Facebook specifically? And what, what is it specifically about the Philippines and Facebook that made this, sure. s this situation happen? Yeah, so um, Facebook is all about world domination. And, you know, they obviously started in the U.S., but really, really quickly, um, their ambitions grew to international scale. And the Philippines was this country that was very ripe to be a sort of testing ground for um, what a Facebook country would look like. So in 2013, they heavily, they, they went to the Philippines, they heavily subsidized Facebook, um, they partnered with carriers in the Philippines, um, and ev every time you would sort of engage on the internet through Facebook, it would be free data. And then if you actually went outside of the walled garden of Facebook and clicked around on the open web, that would be like using up data, using up money. Um, and so eventually, uh, you know, the, the Philippines is one of the most online countries um, in the world. It's like called the selfie capital. Like Manila is called the selfie capital of the world by some online agencies, advertising agencies. Um, so it, eventually, uh, two, it's about two thirds of the Philippines that is that has access to the Internet. And all of them, virtually all, it's something like 99 percent have Facebook accounts. Uh, so for a lot of Filipinos, the way to get access to news, to be online at all, is through Facebook, through these links that are being shared on Facebook, through this like extreme rhetoric and um, through it, this algorithmic, algorithmic ranking system that prioritizes outrage and, um, you know, extreme emotions, mm -hmm. including Duterte's platform, which so hand in hand goes with that. So one piece of the, the chemistry of the situation was Facebook in the Philippines. But another thing I'm really curious about in reporting, the experience of reporting this article was, um, so Duterte used this network of strategists and influencers, and they were very willing to talk to you on the record. And you know there are many parallels, I think, between your article and 
um, the 2016 election in the United States and the Trump administration. And it's a very stark contrast. We don't see Trump administration officials willing to speak on the record. We just had the situation with Secretary Pompeo banning NPR from a trip because he was unhappy about a, an interaction with an NPR reporter. So how did you get all these people to talk to you? <laughs> well, it's weird. I don't actually think of them as like, uh, well, there are officials um, that are part of his organization. But in the beginning, the people who are really the Duterte um, supporters, the, the boosters, if you will, were um, influencers, sort of the parallel I see is like the alt-right here. Um, so like Milo Yiannopoulos and um, I don't know, Alex Jones and all those kinds of characters. Um, there was this parallel world of these influencers on Facebook. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? Um, how did you get them to talk to yes. you? <laughs> uh, so I, I had a few advantages. I speak the language, I speak Tagalog. So, and I grew up there. So when I got interested in this story, I started reaching out to these influencers and also the uh, people who were um, part of the campaign, the, the digital campaign of Duterte leading up to the election. And then we're now in communications positions officially within the Duterte cabinet. Um, and I sort of pitched to them that I could write a better story um, having grown up in the Philippines and having all this context. Um, but I also find that um, sources in the Philippines are quite willing to talk. Um, it's just sort of a, the challenge is parsing out um, what is reportable from this like sort of double speak that um, they spew. <laughs> um, so how long did you spend in the Philippines reporting the story? I spent two weeks. Okay. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was intense, like a lot to do in that time. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Another another piece of the experience that I would love to hear you more talk a bit more about was the um, your time with the freelance photojournalists on what you called the night shift. Yeah. So um, you described the night shift in your article, um, and I'm just going to read a tiny bit of it because I think it sort of helps give some of the, the context. So every night in Manila, a group of journalists work to document the victims of Duterte's war on drugs. They gather at the main city police station along United Nations Avenue at 10 p.m., waiting for tips. When they get one, they mobilize like a fire brigade. Their cars and caravan, they speed through the near empty streets, headlights blazing, hoping to beat police investigators, some of whom reportedly have a track record of altering crime scenes and intimidating witnesses. So how did you get connected with the night shift and how, how much time did you spend with them and what was that like? The night shift is a crazy reporting beat and it was pretty easy to connect with them um, because there's so much international interest in the um, drug war and how that's going. And so they actually, this um, group of freelancers, they often have, will have like an international reporter go along with them for the ride, like for the caravan. Um, so, it, you know, I, I knew that they had a schedule uh, going in when I booked my trip to the Philippines. I knew that the shift started at 10 p.m. and went all the way to 5 a.m. and that it could be intense and that you could see dead bodies. <laughs> um, and, you know, I write in my story that um, I have it here somewhere, but the, the number of dead bodies, uh, the highest number in 24 hours, um, of bodies that showed up because of the war on drugs was 32, like over that one night shift. Um, so I had an in, you know, I, I also have journalist friends in the Philippines who helped me, um, you know, just get that set up. Um, and when I went, it was nuts. It was, um, I did not see, I did not see anyone get shot or like freshly murdered, thank God. But um, there was um, a wake for a 13-year-old boy who had been shot by a policeman. Um, and it, it, you know, it was just like this community of um, people in this shanty town uh, gathered around him and his mom, who was, you know, just devastated, like staring at the body. Um, and yeah, so I... What, when I was conceiving of this story, I wanted 
the drug war to be part of the story because I wanted to connect the human consequences of um, Facebook's platform to to like the drug war and to show that it's not just you know algorithms operating in a void and changing people's opinions, but the ultimate cost of misinform disinformation, I should say, um, is sometimes like an actual human death toll. Yeah. I, I think that came came through really clear, really clearly. Um, so I wanted to shift focus a little bit, and Chiran, I wanted to uh, to ask you. Um, I have a moment to get your microphone. So your research has focused on studying and identifying disinformation on social media, but mm -hmm. focused on the US context. Mm -hmm. um, so as you read Davy's article, were there mm -hmm. particular parallels between the United States and the Philippines that stood out to you? Um, and if so, what were they? Yeah, right. Uh, yes, there are many. <laughs> uh, one that really was striking, not, though not surprising, is how kind of emotions, and especially fear, is uh, weaponized. Uh, by kind of, I guess, both in the case of Duterte, you have uh, the drug war in the case of, I guess, uh, in the US, if you think about the election and the um, issues that uh, uh, surfaced uh, immigration and kind of uh, Islam and othering of others, uh, you know, uh, othering of, of um, uh, individuals, um, these kinds of cases where um, we know that uh, it uh, draws attention and uh, as, and as a result of that, uh, social media platforms also are responding to that. Oh, yeah, people are liking this, so this is the kind of stuff that we should be uh, showing. Uh, so, um, and uh, but it's actually not just social media. I think we also need to recognize that it's also in the case of mass media uh, because these kinds of cases are seen as being newsworthy, and therefore you can't find a way not to uh, cover. So I think um, in, in both cases you you see this and. I think even before um, the advent of social media, if you look at research, um, you see that uh, negativity, you know, um, sort of sells, and 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 I think that was very kind of visible to me in when I was um, reading the article. The other thing that was um, uh, that was uh, striking was again what I think about is almost like this two uh, two step flow model where you have this influential people that are uh, producing content and they have visibility and then uh, once they reach enough people you kind of have then the kind of more person you know um, the um, individual to individual connections that uh, uh, further disseminate this content so you have that in the case of uh, Philippines but you also have in the US there were kind of public pages that have had um, uh, quite a uh, large exposure, and uh, through that they were able to uh, spread uh, the information. Uh, the other thing I will say is particularly about, uh, maybe this is a side story, but uh, the case of a, a dilemma where, where, where um, once the fake news, or like this information, I should say, is out, uh, it was hard to correct. Uh, and uh, that we see not, kind of not only Anecdotally, but we see this in research that uh, once uh, this really trying to uh, combat something after it's already had enough exposure is sort of like you lost that game. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think those were um, really a few of parallels. I think I was maybe if, uh, the cases where things are different were maybe actually more uh, striking to me. So please tell us more <laughs> about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I think uh, one uh, is. Um, the uh, so for, for instance in in the U.S. in 2016 uh, we knew that there was a lot of uh, purchased content uh, that was responsible for people being exposed to um, uh, information. While uh, uh, you know, as we see, you know also from uh, Davies uh, 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 article, that at least they claim. Uh, that that is not really the case. That is, the, the Duterte uh, regime was not claiming that they were actually uh, kind of um, um, buying ads uh, to reach people. So I think that's one thing that we are really concerned about in the U.S., which is this um, uh, personalization of of, uh, of information, where uh, the um, uh, political elite can ask, kind of reach out to particular people and give them a very narrow message, and uh, there is no basically accountability for that. Uh, so it's still available, obviously, in the in the uh, case of Philippines. I was just uh, surprised that that was not part of uh, a big part of the the uh, problem. Um, 
the other thing that was interesting again because I'm more interested like not I'm in the kind of technical uh, side of things how um, coming from a computer science background so thinking about like how do we solve these problems the solutions would be quite different in that uh, in the US again uh, most content that we're thinking about is text content that is kind of hosted on third party websites and then is shared on, on Facebook. While uh, in the case of Philippines, there's a lot of kind of na uh, the original content that is produced on Facebook and there's a lot more image uh, uh, kind of um, um, content which is me different like multimedia, which is we don't really have good solutions for that. So if you look at research is mostly on text and how do we identify domains that are that are producing uh, um, low quality uh, content or disinformation. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, so that was that was um, uh, another um, uh, another uh, big part of the uh, I guess uh, difference. And I think the biggest one is that is you were mentioning in in the Philippines you have Facebook is the place to get the news. While we talk a lot about social media and how people are getting their news from social media, but still to a large extent people are getting their news from other sources so if you look at uh, there is a recent uh, work uh, 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 that was looking at um, com score so basically a panel of of uh, US um, uh, folks in the US and uh, looking at uh, where they're getting get their news and it's mostly TV right so um, and uh, so it, it's striking to me that we are seeing similar patterns uh, and despite this fact and that's what tells me that social media is maybe a part of it, but it's not the part of it. And uh, it's basically because of the political systems or social systems that we have um, uh, that kind of perpetuate this kind of behavior. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that um, one thing that interested me in talking about the parallels between the Philippines and the US, um, so the Trump election happened and then, you know, Obviously, the Philippines was um, had already elected President Duterte, um, and then there was Brexit, and it was just like this weird trend of authoritarianism, and sort of doing a look back on um, what transpired in 2016. Um, the Philippines was first in a lot of ways. Um, the election came six months. The Philippine election came six months before the U.S. Um, you saw a lot of the tactics that. Uh, were used in that election, be replicated in the U.S. election, this like meme warfare, uh, videos, influencers, like all these sorts of things uh, where there's, there's actually a pattern that you could start to see of how to weaponize Facebook. Um, so I thought that was like really fascinating to pick apart. Like it is also like possible, not I, I, wouldn't say that there's any, um, uh, you know, sort of evidence, concrete evidence of this, but you know, the 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 sort of conspiracy <laughs> or the the um, suspicion is that you know the Russians or you know the IRA, um, they they the the influencers in the Philippines learned from the IRA because the IRA has like been around since like 2015, 2014. Um, and also it, the tactics in the Philippines um, could have informed some of the stuff that happened in the 2016 election over here in the US. So just the kind of creepy um, dominoes that were just falling one after the other around that time period, I think made me really want to write the story. That's, that's really interesting. So I'm gonna do a quick aside and point out that this, this afternoon, we're being very careful tonight not to refer to what these campaigns were as fake news. Um, fake news has a has a specific meaning. I think prior to the election of President Trump, uh, often we could use fake news to mean this kind of disinformation that was being spread around on social networks. But um, now fake news has itself become a kind of propaganda where uh, it's used to um, dismiss news or information that the president doesn't like. So we are mostly this evening or this afternoon saying disinformation to describe the kind of intentional um, spreading of false information of um, 
you know, in the case of um, Delima, we're talking about sl like slander and libel, but anything that where we're intentionally spreading a false narrative, we're calling that disinformation tonight. I don't know if either of you want to say more about that. Yeah, I think it's worth distinguishing disinformation from misinformation, too. <laughs> There's so many terms. Um, and we were actually over lunch talking about how it's really difficult to study this because um, the academic space around this is global and we all don't work from the same definition sometimes. Um, but misinformation is just sort of like when, you know, people share a piece of false news, maybe unintentionally believing it and amplifying it, um, but, but they did not have the intent to actually insert some piece of false information into the discourse or, you know, have malicious intent behind it. Yeah, so I think there's a lot of um, research now in trying to even just create this ontology of what kind of problematic types of behavior uh, we are we are dealing with. I'll say I think maybe I am uh, sort of partly responsible or partly the group of researchers that we initially started using this this uh, terminology and it was uh, repurposed and um, uh, perhaps somewhat um, uh, you know. Uh, decided to uh, stick with it to some degree, but I think it's important for us to clarify exactly what we're talking about, and each of these different types of problematic behavior kind of ask for uh, different interventions, and that's why it's important to make that distinction. So um, going back now to this conversation about the parallels between these two countries, um, one of the things that I think you pointed out, Davy, um, over lunch is that this in, this in these cases, the disinformation is coming from the top. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the US, we have all of this coming from Trump, and in the Philippines, it's President Duterte. And so um, what, what is it about, um, like, what happens when the people wielding social media the most effectively are the authoritarians? Um, you know, these, the social media was billed as being this democratizing tool that it was going to give voice to everyone. And what we're seeing now is that it's actually just working really, really well to enable authoritarianism. Yeah. So what, why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, a couple of things. Um, early in social media's sort of existence, the Arab Spring, which to this day, the tech companies herald as like, oh, social media is going to change the world. It allows all of these um, parts of the world that go unheard to be publicized. Um, that was sort of the early part of the like positive uh, view on social media. I think it was really when they started doubling down on algorithms that pr that um, prioritized engagement, where it started to become um, uneven, like tilted towards people who already had notoriety, who already were in power or um, lobbying to have power. So. You know, Duterte's um, rhetoric is very extreme. Um, it's in my piece, but he uh, lobbied for the drug war so much that he said things like he wanted to throw all the dead bodies of the slain drug dealers into Manila Bay and fatten the fish there with the bodies. Um, so, and that sort of thing commands attention on Facebook. So, um, that that right now, you know, the problem that we have, I think that I'm not sure I know the, what the solution is for yet, is it's a lot of the times the people in power now and their supporters who really rise to the top on these platforms. Um, and the fact that you can actually, as an influencer, ride the coattails of this engagement priority um, that these platforms and algorithms put on top is uh, another problem. So um, one of the characters I have in the story is this woman called Mocha Usan, who's this Tila Tequila <laughs> sort of figure um, in the Philippines. And she lobbied hard for Duterte. And you know she used to be a sex guru, actually. So she used to actually do these like live streams with people asking like sex questions and things like that. And when Duterte Star started to rise, she just hitched her wagon to that, like completely changed what she was doing on Facebook and made it all political. So it's a real problem. Like these algorithms um, prioritizing engagement, I think is really, really insidious. 
Yeah, so I think, uh, and this is not even specific to political behavior, so I'm going to geek out a little bit and take this to kind of it actually <laughs> it talk about the paper. Uh, so there is actually a very influential uh, work called the Music Lab, um, quite maybe a decade ago, where the researchers were interested in how social signals can uh, distort uh, our uh, understanding of um, kind of quality of, uh, in, that, in their particular case, songs. So they created these um, um, universes, if you will, and assigned people randomly to each of these universes. And in some of those, there were no social signals, so people were seeing kind of like a random order of, of um, a random order of uh, um, um, songs, and they would kind of judge them for themselves. Uh, and in half of the maybe other universes now, people are uh, kind of getting the social signal, which is that like a ranked list of what kind of things people already liked. Uh, and what they were seeing was that uh, in the cases where you have the social signal, one, you have actually a, a lot more kind of, it's mo a lot more uneven, uh, it's a, a lot more unequal, the kinds of things that uh, get attention. And perhaps kind of more concerning is that uh, it, was n it was only weakly tied to actual uh, uh, quality. So the things that kind of you know, randomly get uh, initially enough engagement are going to be seen as being high quality and therefore going to kind of get more, uh, more kind of likes, if you will, at the end. So um, the, the distinction between, I think, getting our news from social media and getting it from the mass media is that you have uh, hopefully, when, when they're good institutions, you have kind of journalists that are not only looking at uh, you know, what would get engagement, hopefully that's a very uh, kind of weak signal, if, if any, but really kind of the actual quality. So, uh, so this is really sort of innate, if, if you will, in the way that we process information, because uh, it's, we are, like, we are lazy, we, are, we don't have enough time to look at everything, so we're going to look at the top things, we're not going to go and, and seek out information from, uh, from different sources, so what is kind of provided to you is uh, what you interpret to be, uh, to be, uh, kind of valuable. So that's the, I think that's, and perhaps even worse in the case of political news because now we also have our kind of ideology, our, our identities that are kind of built in that makes it even, even more, uh, you know, um, it's harder, harder to solve. Yeah, I think um, in the, a, a difference in the Philippines um, compared to the US is that the news institutions in the Philippines are not as storied and um you know there are a lot of sort of newer um online publications cropping up um there are newspapers that have been around for a while uh but they don't have the sort of institutional um majesty <laughs> institutional um uh, clout that an organization like the washington post or the new york times has so you know, they're, that's almost like they're trusted as a given because of their deep, deep history, that sort of thing. But in the Philippines, there's nothing like that. And so absent that, sometimes these social signals that you're talking about um, can seem like the most informative um, signal to uh, shape your opinion around. And then the other thing, I think, when we're talking about disinformation um, is when you have a platform that is featuring like tons of engagement, like sort of prioritizing that, um, and it's gamed by people who understand how the platform works, I think that the appearance of support can sometimes actually affect people's behavior and support. Um, so, uh, you know, I was, um, when I was starting to, when I started to get interested in this story and it, I started to see a lot of these comments about Duterte, this like amazing, like strong man of a candidate um, that was coming up in the 2016 election in the Philippines. I had no idea who he was, um, but I was sort of like, wait, should I be paying attention to him? Like, who who is this? Like, why does everyone keep talking about him? Um, and it just creates this like sort of ambiance that everyone is for him. That's all you see on Facebook. So um, I think that's kind of what swayed some voters as well. Um, mm -hmm. Though I, I, I will say that's like anecdotal. It's not from data or numbers or anything. Right. I mean, I guess something that is relevant and from the US context is that uh, we do see, and there's 
quite a lot of literature on this, uh, basically weakening of institutions mm -hmm. uh, that um, sort of ties to, I think, I think what you're saying, and also just, uh, for instance, Trump, I think, is also a good example of this, where he was kind of a, a product of, of TV, so he, he kind of knows what gets attention mm -hmm. and, and what does not, so oh it's, 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 hard, so it's hard not to cover him, right? So that's, like, that's one component. The other components, again, it used to be that we used to have this um, um, media landscape where you have uh, mass media sits between the political elite and, and uh, and uh, uh, the citizens and kind of uh, shapes and, and, and tells, uh, tells the uh, kind of media, the public what to, what to care about. Uh, and that kind of also has, has uh, changed, uh, partly as a function of uh, the use of social media platforms where they're there and they can directly, uh, the, uh, directly uh, communicate with their, with their uh, citizens where, uh, there can be certain, you know, again, theoretically there could be positive things about this, but at the end of the day that also kind of leads to this, these weakening of uh, various types of institutions, including, I guess, mass media and, and even uh, political parties. Yeah, I, I think that's totally right. And I think that um, the, the flip side of um, mass media not being the broker anymore, or the main broker at least, is when the broker is the supposedly democratic platform, um, but one that prioritizes engagement above all and anger and fear, um, that's how the sort of authoritarianism rises. Um, if you're just a kind of mild candidate who um, wants to, you know, enact like a like fine policy, <laughs> or, you know, it's not it's not something. Uh, like uh, like Duterte's message of I am going to solve what all the social ills of this country um, are and I am going to solve it by getting rid of all the people who push and use drugs like that you know the, the sort of like milder messages don't really rise to the top right yeah so just a quick reminder if you have questions raise your hand and someone will bring you a card to write them down we are happy and excited to take your questions in a few more minutes um so we've been talking quite a bit about the um what's broken and what the problems are so i'd love it if we could talk a little bit about possible solutions to this problem of disinformation um technical approaches social approaches um what do we think might is likely to be successful in ocharan this is something that you research so maybe we can start with that um, sure. So uh, this is a uh, this is not a technical problem. So I think the solutions by design cannot be purely technical. It is a socio-technical problem. So I think it's kind of both. Uh, and um, so when I think about what are the ways to to try to combat these kinds of problematic behavior, I kind of uh, I go back to uh, Larry Lessig has this uh, framework of there are these four modes that regulate behavior, and that also applies to cyber behavior. So there's laws, there's uh, kind of markets. You can basically change the uh, the revenue streams, the pr uh, pricing strategies, so that uh, you force uh, the uh, bad actors to uh, basically uh, stop. Uh, doing things, uh, norms that we have in our uh, communities, and uh, what he calls the architecture, which is basically the kind of, in, in, the, in the case uh, of, of Facebook or other platforms, it would be the, the kind of the user interface, if you will, of, of, our, of, the, of the platforms and what it allows people to do. Uh, so in my research, um, I've uh, kind of m looked more at uh, uh, sort of market uh, uh, solutions, which is how, uh, can, how can we think about uh, systems where we, um, uh, pr for instance, having, by having ad firms uh, blocking uh, the, uh, the producers of this information, uh, how can we basically kind of sort of kill their revenue stream uh, so that uh, they would have less incentive, at least pay off, uh, to be on, on, on these uh, uh, producing such content. Uh, so I think that in terms of the solutions, um, there's really no clear one that is like, just gotcha, we're, we're done. Uh, so, uh, and, but uh, there are ones that are sort of more, um, you can, 
address more quickly. So again, that would be if you can get Google and Amazon and so forth to actually say, okay, we're, no, we're not actually going to uh, uh, serve ads on, on these platforms. That would be a, sort of a <coughs> quick solution, but it's not a permanent solution. I think the things that will really make a difference is the um, norms uh, changing. So, and, and, the, and that, was, that is unfortunately not a technical solution. That's basically us as a society uh, having value systems that uh, uh, are kind of well com communicated and understood and, and uh, actually lived. Uh, so, uh, but in terms of the technical solutions, we actually are, as a community of researchers, myself included, working on automated methods to detect these things at scale the, because the challenges that they pop up everywhere. Uh, and uh, so how can we uh, do this quickly so that um, if uh, there is action to be taken, uh, it, it can be taken. But again, technology can only help you find them out. They can't make you act on it. Uh, so that's where I think the, uh, the uh, kind of norms come into play. Again, architecture matters a lot and that's where I think the platforms have uh, responsibility you have, if you have a like button, people are going to use that and they're going to do something with it. So mm -hmm. understanding what that like button means uh, for people's kind of behaviors and uh, working on these, plat you know, creating systems that perpetuate, that don't perpetuate uh, uh, problematic uh, behavior is something that I think the, that, that falls on, on the, on the um, 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 platforms themselves. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it's weird. My beat at the New York Times is covering disinformation and global disinformation, which uh, is a, like almost a natural offshoot of this piece since it is about disinformation in the end. Um, and in my reporting in the past six months, I've found that, you know, the problem of disinformation, that the way the tech companies look at it, they are happy to take down foreign influence operations. Um, you know, rhetoric injected into discussions uh, domestically by operators in Russia. Like, say they discover a batch of pages on Facebook that um, claim to be, you know, yeah, pro, like, Black Lives Matter, um, but are actually, the page owners are from Turkey or uh, from Egypt or Russia. Uh, they, they'll take that down in a snap, but the thing about disinformation that feels harder to um, manage is the disinformation that's happening domestically, and that's actually kind of what I wrote about in my piece as well. It's domestic disinformation, like among citizens themselves, that's a really difficult problem, and the platforms don't want to appear biased in any way, so every time false information is weaponized um, and has this sort of layer of political bent on it, the platforms are like, oh gosh, we can't touch this <laughs> because it'll seem like um, we're pro-Democrats or pro-Republicans or something. And, and then we get at this like standstill where we don't know how to move forward um, with this problem. I think that you're right. Like I think this is absolutely, you need a ton of stakeholders invested in this and you know it's like researchers like yourself i think it's like policymakers civil society groups civil advocacy groups citizens um becoming more informed about media literacy all of that stuff journalists too <laughs> uh but so far uh, at least from my reporting it's been so frustrating to see how there aren't um there isn't enough uh, there aren't enough bridges among those groups so that we can all work together to move forward. There are so many like different priorities for these different groups. Um, like, to, you know, companies will maximize revenue, civil society groups will like stick to their issues. Um, you know, researchers <laughs> can take a while <laughs> to publish papers. Um, and then tech companies also don't provide data, which can make the research slower. Um, so I personally <laughs> am not that optimistic about, you know, articulating, you know, here's what we need to do, like A, B, C, let's take these steps. I think, I don't know, there has to be some like come to Jesus moment where everyone works together at the same time. And I 
that hasn't happened yeah. and we know it's happening now leading into 2020 um and we're still not really pushing on that um doesn't help that um in some ways the administration in power right now is benefiting from the status quo uh but yeah i'm, I'm not yeah i'm not that <laughs> optimistic i mean personally I, I think you're you're touching up on excellent points and again as a researcher i will say like you know the I, I think I would also take part of the blame, and I see that also when I look at research out there. Uh, people are like, okay, okay, we're gonna have a fake news classifier. Let's just pull some data. Let's uh, you know throw our fancy uh, fancy methods on it, and you know, poof, I solved the problem. We did not really solve the problem. Uh, so I think right that is I indeed we have to have more engagement so that we're like, oh, okay, this is the kind of thing that we actually need to solve. And uh, this is how you once you again you you have a classifier doesn't mean like automated method to detect them doesn't mean you know you're um, able to stop it. Uh, so there there are really there has to be a lot more uh, kind of communication across different uh, uh, stakeholders. I. Uh, so, right, in terms of being optimistic, I wouldn't necessarily say I am optimistic, but I also, th that's partly because I actually don't, I think, again, that social media is only part of the problem, mm -hmm. where we see these historical trends in, in, uh, in uh, how uh, we are kind of processing information, how we are treating out groups, how we are uh, kind of deciding to expose ourselves to only information that is kind of, uh, um, positive of, of our side uh, that th those are you know those predate uh, these systems so it we kind of need to change our societies and the systems at the same time uh, and there are also technical uh, issues of so if you want to be doing these kinds of detections at scale we need people to actually be able to do this uh, reliably and there is some evidence based on uh, uh, some research that um, actually people can be good at detecting uh, false information or uh, disinformation, but there is huge variance in that. And so how do we kind of build these uh, scale, again, <laughs> right, coming from a t technical person, so scalable systems where uh, we, we don't have to uh, put too much on kind of fact checkers and, and, and journalists and always be like, okay, just give us things. Yeah. But we actually are uh, building kind of self-sustaining systems where there is kind of buying buy from all stakeholders that, um, th that uh, kind of strikes the right balance between the different trade-offs that we have as different values that we, uh, that we hold as, as, as societies. Yeah, um, I, I really like that point about scale because I think um, you know, the tech platforms, the tech companies are absolutely incentivized by revenue and increasing revenue and um, always having that like upward trend uh, and pleasing investors in that way. They always have to be like making progress and they're obsessed with scale. And that's why these things are so hard to detect. I feel like if tech companies might be more comfortable with a smaller size, maybe we have some hope to actually look at all of these problems mm -hmm. um, on a smaller scale, yeah. but uh, the where the negativity comes in is I'm not sure that the the companies will ever be comfortable being just yeah. like about this small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, sorry, speaking to one point that I think uh, the other again kind of selfishly coming from a researcher's pr perspective, the data like we we need data to be able mm -hmm. to study these uh, behaviors that's the only way that we're going to be able to i mean us having the data doesn't necessarily mean we are going to be able to solve the problem but we're certainly not going to solve the problem if we don't have the data to understand these behaviors so we do see some uh push uh, towards uh, that so uh, there are uh, some initiatives like social science one that mm -hmm. that provide data but uh finding ways uh, to allow studying these types of uh, behavior uh in a responsible kind of way where mm -hmm. uh, obviously the privacy and security concerns are, are taken in, into account. I think that's also a very important uh, problem to, uh, to think about. So in a moment, we're going to begin to take audience questions. Um, but just to wrap up this portion of our conversation, I wanted to ask if either of you have any advice for our audience about how to identify disinformation in the wild. So how can lay people um, begin to recognize and identify when something that they're reading or something they might be thinking of sharing is actually problematic? What can they be looking out for? Um, I can start. I 
would look at the source, of course. Um, is it a trusted news source? Um, are there, you know, uh, other publications that uh, are vetting the same thing and coming out with the same set of facts? Um, you know, where are they getting the facts from? Like, be really aware of when a report seems like it's uh, slanted or has a very strong point of view or opinion or it feels like they're telling you how to think. I think that's that's one of the main things to look out for. Um, but, you know, reporting is supposed to be here's what happened. So it, I think looking at trusted news sources and even if it is not, you know, of course, so, uh, a source of information can come from like anywhere. It can come from like a person and then. CNN or the New York Times will report on what that person said. Like, if that person posted that first, it doesn't mean that they're not um, credible. But just, like, the vetting around the primary source, I think you have to be really careful about. Um, yeah, I, I, I would also say, like, virality is tricky, and we should be aware that some of the things that go viral sometimes are... Uh, these like algorithmic sort of like um, this like candy that we uh, are attracted to so be aware of that like when something is going viral it doesn't mean that it's untrue but is there something like really emotional or really outrage inducing about this piece of content that makes you want to step back and just sort of like be like okay well this makes me feel enraged this makes me feel like really scared like let me just take a look at this closer and see, you know, devoid of emotion, what is it saying? What are what are the set of facts? Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I think the other thing that I'm thinking about, so the, mo the biggest filtering of information happens as a function of what you choose uh, to uh, pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So I think the one thing that I will add there is, is <laughs> kind of frustrating that times it might be for you, I think it's important to expose yourself to a kind of diverse uh, set of uh, mm -hmm. um, um, kind of sources and people. Uh, if nothing else, at least at the end, that you're not surprised uh, when, when things happen. So uh, I we do live in echo chambers, uh, and it's, it's good to try to break them uh, as much as possible. Um, so that when you get a piece of information, you at least can perhaps see the, the other, other side of that. So that's one that is not particular to like one piece of content, but just in general, a general behavior that will hopefully make your uh, kind of news uh, diets more balanced. There's obviously, again, there's research that suggests that if you are only shown the kind of most extreme side or uh, kind of a version of the other side might actually make you more enraged so it's not that so perhaps it's you need to be still more careful about maybe kind of following people that are that sort of are not as extreme on the other side but at least allows you to get exposed to other side of uh, this kind of um, aisle and the again not for you have to process but uh, the Again, we know from research that once something is out there, it's really hard to stop. So, uh, so it's you know important to be able to stop sharing. Like, <laughs> don't do it right away, right? So, uh, just give yourself a couple of minutes uh, before uh, before you share something. Is perhaps uh, another uh, another point. And there are a lot of efforts in uh, kind of media literacy that are. Uh, kind of shared by a lot of great uh, media institutions. There, like news, even Newsium has one, News Literacy. There are various uh, kind of efforts out there. So those actually give you a really nice kind of list of quick uh, kind of tricks that you, can, that you can use. So I won't really kind of repeat them here, but uh, they actually kind of give, uh, kind of, I think, good advice. But at the end of the day, it's, um, we are in a kind of decentralized uh, information sharing uh, system, so it's not that easy, right? I, all these things I'm telling you, I try to, for instance, uh, uh, follow people that I wouldn't agree with. Mm -hmm. There's a limit to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, right? So it, it is. It is not. It is not easy. <laughs> yeah. I'll I'll add to that that um, I think the the flip side of all of these pieces of false news going around 
Um, and you touched on this a little bit where if you repeat a lie, it, there are some studies that actually show that even if you say, you know, sort of like fake and then the, the yeah. statement that um, is false, you'll, people will remember the statement more than yeah. the actual uh, idea that it is fake. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, there's like a risk to, you know, um, giving it more oxygen. Um, there's like this concept that this professor, uh, Whitney Phillips, you probably know who I'm talking about, um, uh, this concept she talks about uh, where she discusses the oxygen of amplification, where, you know, you have to be mindful about, like you said, what you share, because even if you're sharing to try to correct the record, sometimes that ends up spreading the actual disinformation. And it's something that, you know, of course, the media has an enormous responsibility to, uh, you know, be aware of and have on their shoulders. Um, just, you know, what, do, what you write down enters it into a record that gives it legitimacy. And so I think we have to be really careful about those issues and choose, pick and choose what rises to the level of coverage. That's my um, journalism sort of like insidery take on this inside baseball tape. Great, thank you. So now we're going to turn to the Wallace Fellows uh, to start taking audience questions. And if you think of a question at some point during this section, again, just raise your hand and a card, someone will bring a card to you so you can ask. Thank you. Um, so our first question um, from our audience is for you, Davey, um, about reaction to your story. Um, so are people in the Philippines now more informed and aware of the ma manipulation that you reported on and do they care? Got it. Um, that's a really good question. Part of my story was the about the media part of the, the pro Duterte ecosystem in the Philippines, and um, I go through it in my piece. But the trust in media institutions in the Philippines to begin with was quite weak, and this um, sort of divisive rhetoric has in a lot of ways made it weaker. I think that in the international community, people are more aware of the problems, but in the Philippines, there's a lot of work to do around media literacy and gev getting everyone even to sort of like some kind of base level understanding that is so crucial that hasn't really happened yet. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there there isn't like, there aren't these trusted sources, these like things that sometimes I think in um, more developed countries uh, people take for granted, you know, historical institutions, institutions that we know and trust through the years to give us accurate information. That sort of thing is weaker in the Philippines and so I think there's more work to do. Um. Another question specifically about the story. So this is uh, from a professor here at the university. Um, so you mentioned that Facebook went to the Philippines as part of a deliberate strategy of global domination in social media. But who from Facebook planned or executed the strategy? Was it Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg, or other Facebook executives? It absolutely was Mark Zuckerberg. Um, he, uh, Facebook is really run, you know, I've covered the company for a few years now, and they're really run from the top down. Um, Mark Zuckerberg has the final say on decisions that are controversial and the push to um, into sort of global dominance from Facebook really was from him. So in 2013-ish, um, that was the first push into the Philippines as like free Facebook and partnering with these carriers to give access to internet data um, through Facebook to citizens for free. And in 2014, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, stood at this tech conference called the Mobile World Conference in Barcelona, I believe, and said, you know, the, the push into the Philippines was so successful, like it was a home run. Um, and, you know, little did we know that that would actually lead to what we have going on today. Um, but yeah, it absolutely was Mark Zuckerberg's decision. It's like his company's ethos, you know, they're, there are stories um, uh, of 
in the early days of Facebook, like the, fir the, en the first few engineers in the office would all gather after meetings and just like sort of huddle and yell like domination or something. Um, like not making that up, that is in the record. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just I embedded in their culture at this point and instilled by Zuckerberg, I think. Um, so Jerry, maybe you can answer this one, a question from a student here at the university. Um, so how can you quantitatively measure disinformation's effect on voting? Does it actually attract new or undecided voters? Because to play devil's advocate, how do we know that this isn't only circulating among people who are already radical and not changing the average person's mind? Right, uh, so causal inference in general is a very hard problem in or outside of, of uh, the uh, political space. So uh, we don't have as much, so if you, if you uh, if you're, um, look at particularly the 2016 uh, election, uh, we actually have uh, little uh, to none evidence that the result was as a, a result of uh, the spread of uh, disinformation. So there, there is um, uh, one uh, uh, study uh, where um, uh, the researchers uh, uh, looked at um, uh, this is um, uh, uh, Jenska uh, uh, at all uh, 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 tried to get at that uh, causally, and uh, the, the the finding that they that they had was that again it was uh, uh, quite a small uh, effect, uh, but that is particularly for for voting, and again we have years of political uh, science and communication literature that suggests that there's kind of very little that, that changes uh, minds, uh, uh, including, again, bro broadly speaking, news media. So um, then it could still be that, again, it's a small effect, but it's in the margins, given that how, how, how small the margins are in the US in, in these elections, it could still be important, maybe not in this election, but these elections going forward. So uh, it's important to not only think about what happened, but what's going to happen. So in terms of, can we say, kind of causally, mm -hmm. if people uh, would be doing what they're doing if they did not get that information, uh, I, I think, again, the, pl the kind of people that can do this is really platforms, right? So the, you can't do this causally. Hopefully you're not randomly <laughs> assigning people to get uh, this information versus not. That's, that's, uh, that's <laughs> very, <laughs> that would not be a good research, but there are certain kind of uh, causal inference frameworks where you can use observational data uh, to, uh, to look at this kind of uh, question. Uh, we don't have that research coming uh, uh, out of these platforms, but there is, so again, there's some data that's being shared, hopefully can lead to some population level, not individual level, population level kind of estimates of what might be uh, effects of, of uh, different kinds of uh, problematic behavior, but we currently don't have that, right? So, uh, and, and having that at the individual level is hard. I don't blame uh, the platforms for not sharing like the entire uh, Facebook data set out there, are all these uh, concerns. So. Um, that's, we don't really have a very good way of uh, saying exactly what happened and why it happened. Yeah, I'll add to that a um, couple of things. Like it, it is true and it's really hard to assign cause and effect um, just from like my own experience interviewing researchers like you um, on that question. Um, at the same time, I think, you know, Facebook uses that to their advantage sometimes, um, and tech companies use this to their advantage sometimes to say, um, you know, famously Mark Zuckerberg after the 2016 US election said that Facebook having an impact on the election was a pretty crazy idea. Um, and then we found out about all the dark ads, the political ads um, that were funded by Russia and that the Russians, the IRA created, you know, pages that looked like Americans and, you know, all this nefarious stuff. And that, like, I don't think that that excuses um, f um, these platforms from responsibility. Uh, and the second thing is, like, it's really hard to measure the cause to effect line, but correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there are some studies on sort of, like, how this entrenches um, existing beliefs mm -hmm. And that can also be its own form of harm. Right, exactly. So, so that's why I think long term, so if we're looking at immediately for a particular election, 
uh, the small, the effect might be small, but we, our behaviors are kind of multifaceted and also correlated. So over time is, is an aspect that we need to be uh, thinking more about. And again, not that I think that social media is the sole reason, but we do have this, our, our, the way that we treat the out groups, the way that we treat information is uh, problematic. And even if they are not, I think, like, I guess maybe that's the point. Even if they are not the cause, if you can do something, maybe that's a reason to do something, right? So uh, that's why being able to understand these behaviors and, and being able to take action is, is, is important. And just following on from that, this is a question from um, a fellow Knight Wallace fellow. Um, is it possible to fight disinformation domestically at a time when people open, openly ignore facts and science? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think to the extent that your role um, in society can uh, sort of speak to that mission. So obviously all the journalists in the newsroom at the New York Times are um, constantly trying to provide the facts that people can use to inform um, their actions and inform the news that they receive. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's that part. Like that's I think what journalists can do and always try to do that over and over. Um, as for ch actually changing people's minds about it, maybe you can speak to that more um, sort of from the sociological R perspective. R right. So it depends on what kind of disinformation or misinformation. Certain types of misinformation perhaps would be easier uh, to, uh, to um, ad address when it's not as kind of strongly tied to our identities. Uh, so health misinformation, so we, we talk a lot about like political misinformation, but like health misinformation is for instance another important uh, 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 co context where uh, the uh, issues that we have in terms of uh, people's, uh, like the cognitive dissonance of, of uh, kind of getting something that doesn't align with your values is less of a concern there, right? So they're having kind of more kind of if you think about the so social to technical scale, maybe more technical problems are, are um, uh, more manageable in, in these kinds of con contexts. So from a technical perspective, uh, researchers are working on finding ways to identify, finding ways to uh, limit the spread of uh, misinformation. Um, and the, we're getting the complexity of the problem as time goes by. Like m m one of my earliest papers was, uh, 2012 was called uh, sp limiting the spread of misinformation. And I had this theoretical model as to how I think people uh, communicate with each other and how they, uh, how they will kind of uh, um, receive information. And if you believe that model, then I have an optimization problem for you to solve that. But uh, reality is that people, um, the way that we communicate with each other is quite complex. So our models need to get uh, more sophisticated, align with how people, um, actually communicate with each other and influence each other uh, and and uh, and basically uh, uh, you know being able to th then we're able to employ uh, these uh, these models to be able to solve these problems but uh, so it's basically understanding humans <laughs> and uh, once we understand the humans I think the the, uh, the technical solutions are are going to be kind of easier but the other thing about the, I guess technical um, solutions is we have our models are never 100% accurate. So when we uh, when we give a piece of kind of information saying this is disinformation, you're not giving actually a binary information or whether or not it is disinformation. You're saying my model is like 78% accurate, uh, uh, confident that this is disinformation. So how what what we do with that uh, is again a function of. Um, our values and, and uh, what kind of accuracy we are okay with, right? And we know that people are not very good at uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, um, kind of probabilistic uh, data. We saw that in the 2016 election where people were like, Clinton's obviously going to win. The, the models are saying that, that uh, us that models were uh, communicating uh, kind of um, um, confidence or lack thereof, but that was kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, skipped through. So. Um, 
I, I kind of always go back to uh, the human aspect of this. Uh, the, the technical aspect is sort of, I, I think, easier. And on that human aspect and understanding humans, so this is a follow-up question from Patrick, one of our um, fellows. Um, you said that we sort information for accuracy, but there's strong evidence that shows that we prefer to sort um, our information for what we already believe. Um, it's just easier and faster. So what can we do to overcome this? Right. <laughs> uh, so um, again, part of it is um, when we're thinking about the, the final decision that we make, a lot of steps kind of lead to that. That's why I was saying the first step is kind of how you filter out information. And, uh, and that's a function of, let's say, on social media, who you choose to follow, for instance. And, um, and so exposing yourself uh, to, uh, to uh, such uh, kind of diverse uh, um, uh, sets of information is, is uh, one uh, important part of the equation. But doing that in a, again, uh, smart way, you're, if, you're, if you're trying to expose yourself to diverse but just crazy information, that's perhaps going to uh, make you think even worse about uh, uh, the kind of uh, the outgroup. Again, I'm, I'm more thinking about the uh, US context. Uh, so, um, uh, but uh, I in US, we in the US we have uh, that evidence that it's selective exposure is indeed uh, the case. You can try to fight uh, fi uh, fight it, uh, but if you just randomly are trying to expose yourself to uh, information from the out group, then actually it, may it might make things worse. I think I think to add to that, um, I think that it being really intentional is important because it is our natural um, inclination to maybe, you know, go with what we feel yeah. is, sounds right to us, yeah. um, knowing that there's, not knowing that there's bias included in that. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's like part of me media literacy is uh, being really intentional about stepping back and seeing that you're being emotional about this piece of news or piece of information and um, evaluating it on the basis of accuracy, just like going against that inclination and doing doing the check on yourself. And then the other thing, I mean, um, I know I, I, it's sort of my nature to bring up this question because I'm a tech journalist and um, you know my job is to question platforms, but I think they're really bad on domestic disinformation as opposed to foreign um, interference, like coordinated and authentic behavior coming from foreign operators, and that they need to take on more responsibility um, for domestic disinformation and not unevenly apply their um, policies uh, to different you know, sets of people depending on where they come from. Um, I think that's something that we still haven't figured out um, how to deal with and that platforms are very um, sort of hesitant to deal with because they don't want to look biased. And then, I mean, policy? Like, maybe policy is sort of our way out of this. Um, there is, you know, the Honest Ads Act that's um, in the pipeline that people generally think is positive. Um, and you know that more transparency around ads, that kind of thing. Um, I think that disinformation, uh, it's gonna be interesting to see what comes out in the um, next few months on policy, I think. Um, you know, actually Elizabeth Warren just came out with her own sort of campaign promise around disinformation and what she wanted to do to address it as president. Um, it can get really tricky though, because you don't want government overstepping and censoring people's speech. But I mean, like all things, this is about balance. And I think we have time for just one more. Just one. OK, so we'll, um, let's bring it back then to Duterte, where we started off. Um, and we're a couple of year, years on now from the story. So how much support does he actually have now in the Philippines? <laughs> he has incredible support. Um, and I actually wrote down some numbers um, of just updated statistics since my story came out. Um, so the the tally of um, victims of the drug war um, officially is around 5,500 according to police, but human rights activists, human rights groups um, that are on the ground um, in the Philippines 
estimate it to closer to 30,000 people who have been slain. And it really does, the drug war disproportionately affects poor communities, poor groups of people. Um, so, you know, he continues to garner incredible amounts of support locally. Uh, and there's also an update, actually. So in late March 2019, this was um, six months after I published the story, Facebook took down um, a set of coordinated accounts um, by the comms director in the Philippines, who, the, the comms person on the social media campaign who was um, in government at that time. Uh, he, there were about 200 accounts that were taken down. So that was a positive step. And um, Facebook, in in my sort of um, estimation, probably did that a few months later so it wouldn't connect back to our article and our reporting. Uh, but that either way, that was good. Um, still, though, Duterte has enormous support. And um, most recently, in December 2019, uh, Duterte banned two senators, U.S. senators, Senators Richard Durbin and Patrick Leahy, from entering the country um, because they had introduced into the U.S. Uh, congressional budget um, a provision that said that they would not allow U.S. government officials, or sorry, Filipino government officials who, were, who had a hand in Lila de Lima's um, arrest and jailing uh, to enter the U.S. Um, and so, you know, they themselves got banned from the Philippines. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, his authoritarianism is still alive and kicking. And, uh, um, you know, it's it's still an ongoing problem for sure. And I think, you know, in reporting the story, like, really, I, I just wanted to raise awareness about this issue. And I... I uh, you know, coming from the Philippines, having grown up there, have always, it's personally resonant with me because um, I have always felt like as a Filipino um, being like an underdog and, you know, sort of like um, a country that on the world stage is not too um, cared about. Uh, and so with this stuff happening before the U.S. election and then the same stuff happening during the U.S. election, it it felt a lot to me like um, the platforms being American-centric companies in American countries uh, uh, sort of instigated the move to scrutinize these platforms and the and the power of these platforms. Um, I really wish that it didn't have to go that far. I wish that they had looked at it even when this was going on in the Philippines, um, and I you know hope that people are informed enough about the situation in the Philippines to continue to raise questions about the situation over there because it still is really quite bad. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. I know, Davy. I know that you really wanted to... So Dave, Davy was worried earlier um, because she was worried that she would not be able to end on an up note, but sometimes you just have to end where it ends and be truthful about uh, where you think things are. And so I appreciate that. Molly and Jaran, I really appreciate this conversation. I also wanted to just point out to you to notice this around the university um, that within the Ford School here, Molly's program um, is called Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program. There is now within the university um, a center on digital ethics that didn't exist several years ago. We at Wallace House are doing many more programs that involve the intersection of journalism and technology. And so I think it's not just a matter of people getting savvier as consumers and users, but people across fields um, collaborating in a cross-disciplinary way um, to try to tackle these intersecting issues that are about psychology, sociology, culture, human behavior, um, and technology so that, so that we can all be better informed. Uh, and, and 
there are other events that you can come to this year if this is a topic that you're interested in within our Wallace House Presents program on March 18th, which is a Tuesday, uh, is, which is a Wednesday, because it is intentionally after St. Patrick's Day, because we can't, we knew no students would come if we had an event on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, we've talked about Facebook a lot today, and Alex Stamos, who is a former Facebook executive, uh, who's now at Stanford University, has agreed to come here to be interviewed on stage at Hill Auditorium by Kara Swisher, who's the executive editor of Recode and a very tough interviewer. Um, and I think that that will, he's been, a, he's been a very interesting voice since he left Facebook, and I think that that will be uh, a very interesting conversation. The title of that event, you'll see it posted around campus, is What Does Big Tech Owe Us? I think the answer is a lot. Um, and then on March 24th, which is also, which is a Tuesday, uh, we have an event called Online Harassment and the Threat to Democracy. Our own Knight Wallace fellow, Elodie Vail, Elodie Vial, here. And uh, a journalist from India, who you may have read about recently, named Rana Ayub who was written about in The New Yorker recently, and we were talking about the Philippines today. We could have also been talking about India and Narendra Modi's regime and tactics, and Rana Ayub is a, um, a journalist who's been targeted there, as many journalists are being, and um, she'll be here for a conversation, and we're going to be talking about online harassment of journalists, and particularly women journalists, because uh, there's a lot of insidious uh, behavior happening and very dangerous behavior. And Molly, are there are there events happening? Not around, not around tech this semester, but often. Great. Well, I you can get on either of our mailing lists, any of our mailing lists. I'm sure there there's a bouquet of mailing lists <laughs> between us up here that you could choose to sign up for. But I thank you for coming out today. Uh, and thank you all for a rich conversation.